Where is God when bad things happen to good people? Have you ever thought about that? Where is he? We put such store on him being there helping us. But where is he? All of us have experienced or will experience in our lifetime um, some tough times. Perhaps someone close to us is no longer close to us, passed away, or maybe broken up with us, or maybe, well, I don't know what else. Everyone will find at some stage in their walk that there's tough stuff. Lamentations. What is a lament? I'd like you to listen to this, um, this, this clip. And you can, you can pick up something of the, the sadness in this um, clip. It's not toe-tapping stuff, is it? Purposefully not. For it was to remind us of the fact that um, the Queen had died. And there were many lumps in many throats as they heard the Lone Piper playing a lament. That's what that piece of music is called. And pieces like it, a lament. It's a loud cry that uh, goes to God and uh, tries to express some of the deep feelings that we have. Do you know, do you know the feeling of that? Have you ever been in a situation where you've cried out to God because of something that's happened? You know, the whole book of Lamentations is one after the other, after the other, after of laments, five chapters. And... Uh, It's dark stuff. It's dark stuff. It reminds us of those difficult times in our lives when we all have to face it. Chapters 1 and 2 have 22 verses. Now, 22 is the number of letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And so 22, um, one stanza, one line uh, for, for each uh, letter in chapters 1 and 2. Uh, chapters 4 and 5 are the same. Uh, chapter 5 isn't, isn't bound to the alphabet, but it's still 22 lines long. 
It's almost as if God is saying, look, here's something that is rememberable. Don't forget it. Say it over and over and over again. Teach it to your kids. Why would he do it? And then in chapter 3, which is the chapter we're going to look at in a minute, it's twice the length. Instead of 22 verses, there's 66. Three lines for every alphabet in the Hebrew language. How dark can it get? I'm going to ask John to come and read. John checked with me when he came in today. He said, are you sure that's the right reading? It's dark. (laughs) It's dark. Come and read it to us, John. Might need your hanky. (laughs) Lamentations 3, 1 to 20. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone and he's made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target of his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughing stock of all my people. They mocked me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and salted me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. And so I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remembered my affliction and my wandering and bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Ever had a bad day? (laughs) Well, the writer was having a bad day. (laughs) We think it might have been Jeremiah. We're not altogether sure about that. Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet, and uh, the book of Lamentations follows right on the heels of the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the the book, was saying to the Hebrew people, look, straighten yourself up or God's going to deal with you. And Lamentations is, look what God's done to you. (laughs) Well, it won't go away. Now, there's a unique problem for for the Christians Whoops, we'll go back one. There's a, a long list, isn't there, of laments that we saw there. And we see darkness, we see being trapped, we see being weighed down, we see being afraid, humiliated, being in turmoil, being exhausted, and it won't go away. Now, some of you may recognize that. Some of you may say, me too. (laughs) I've been there. I know what it's like. He hasn't got that on his own. But there's a unique problem uh, for the Christians. There they are, those, um, those issues. There's a unique problem for the Christians. You see, when, when bad things happen to people who aren't followers of Jesus, they say, it's life. Life's tough. No fairness. I'll just get on with it. But for the Christian, it's different because the Christian says, God will never leave us nor forsake us. It said, God's got our best interests at heart. God will do everything that he can to help us. 
He's on top of things at all times. It doesn't sound like it to me. Not only that, but... Oh, it's a bit, a bit hard to read. Is it? Let me read it out to you because it, it, really, it really is... You see, it's not that God, God says these things are going to come your way. It's saying, I'm going to send them your way. I'm going to send them your way. He has driven me away and to make me to walk in darkness. He has turned his hand against me. He has made my skin. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness. This is God. This is talking about God. He has walled me in so that I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I cry out for help, he shuts out my prayers. Can you believe that? He's barred my way with blocks of stone. He's made my paths crooked, like a bear waiting, lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He dragged me from the path and <laughs> mangled me and left me without help. He drew his, his bow and made me a target for his arrows. Can you imagine it? Target practice. God on you. On your chest is a big, a big bullseye and he's, oh, got him. <laughs> That's what the scripture's saying. He um, pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. He became a laughing stock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has spilled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth. He has trampled me. God has done it. So this passage says, he didn't just allow it, he did it. Do you ever feel like that? In the midst of despair, in the midst of loss, in the midst of struggle, do you swap from saying, where is God, to why did God do this to me? Well, Christopher Wright and Colin Smith, two theologians, have helped me a lot in this. Because um, I must say, Stuart, I struggled with this for a bit. I struggled to get my head around it. <laughs> It's not the God that I, I, I know. It's not the God I want to know. Let's look at verse 1. Verse 1 gives us a, a bit of a clue. And it says there, I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. The rod, the rod. We've come across rod before, haven't we? Do you remember on the 23rd Psalm, we came across a rod? Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Comfort me. It doesn't sound like it, does it? It doesn't sound like it, and yet it's there in the Bible. We see in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 1, that it seems to be back to front somehow. Back to front. I have come under the affliction of the rod of the wrath of God, he says. How hard is that? And yet it's in the Bible. It's there. Sometimes you may feel that God has turned against you. And the pain that a believer can experience is crushing and seems unending. Where is the hope? We, we know because we've been around a bit. We know that um, a few years on, a few decades on, the temple was going to be rebuilt and Jerusalem was going to be reoccupied and it was going to be rebuilt and where there was ruins going to be turned into a city again. And uh, we, we knew that, we know that. When the great exile returned from Babylon under Nehemiah and Ezra and they built it up, they built it up. And the prophecies concerning that um, were in... Uh, in the writings of the Hebrew people, 200 years before Nehemiah and before um, uh, Lamentations. So why didn't, why didn't they meet? Why didn't God say, just remember, 
that it's going to be all right in the end. And, and there again, um, we know that prophecies in the, in, the, in the Old Testament already existing at the time of Lamentations were saying, and one day there's going to be a new Jerusalem, totally new, and all pain and all suffering. Why didn't he mention that? Why didn't he give them something to hang on to? You know, sometimes people are so, so bound in pain and suffering that to talk to them about the future is just not appropriate. It's not appropriate. They're not there. They're not ready for that yet. And of course, Jesus came. He knew what it was like to weep. He knew what it was like to suffer. Uh, he knew what it was to stand where I stand, where you stand, and to enter into darkness and cry out, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? So let's recognize where hope comes from. For the person in darkness, I call this uh, to mind, and that's uh, where I find my hope, we read in verse 21. Call what to mind? What could possibly take this dark passage? As John said, the most terrible passage he's read in the scriptures for a while. What could possibly turn that around? Well, the answer, I think, is found in verse 1. Verse 1 says, I am the man who's seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. It may have been Jeremiah, but I don't think so. I don't think he wrote it. Not this bit. Remember that the whole of the Bible is telling the story of Jesus. Right from the very first chapter to the very last chapter, it's about Jesus. It starts in a garden, finishes in a new city. And right the way through, there's a crimson thread that holds it all together. Uh, a blood thread. And the blood of Jesus. My Jesus. Your Jesus. Pulling it all together. And every book of the Bible, we could take time, we're not going to do it, but we could take time, and we could identify where is Jesus in this particular book of the Bible. Was he uh, there in the lamb that was caught in the thicket, became the substitute lamb uh, when Abraham wanted to make a sacrifice? Was he there? Was that Jesus? We could go all the way through. And similarly, in Lamentations, we can find Jesus in Lamentations. He's there, this dark, dark book, but we can find him there. Every book, he's there. So let's, let's start with um, uh, where chapter 3 starts. I am the man. When, when Moses was talking, to, talking on behalf of God to the Hebrew people, um, God wanted him to speak and say, this is what God is saying. And he said, so just tell me, God, what am I going to say when they say, on whose word are you saying these things? And God said, I am that I am. Um, say, say to them, I am has sent me. And the, the, that little phrase, I am, over the centuries for the Hebrew people became very important. And they, they, it sort of became like code for holy God. Hebrew people, they couldn't mention the name of God, so they found little codes that they could mention. So whenever you find in the Old Testament the, the words, I am, you need to pick up and take notice. Uh, Jesus picked up. He picked up that term when he was living here on earth as a human being, and he, he spoke about his divine character, and he says, I'm the bread of life. I am the light 
of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and I am the vine. You see, Jesus is divine. He's a divine person. Our doctrine in the Salvation Army says that he is truly and properly God. I am. I want to put it to you that these words, two little words, unashamedly point to the holy aspect of Christ. But it doesn't end there because he then said, I am the man. The man. And we see time and time again that this passage that John so well read to us, we see Jesus in there if we have a look. He was bereft. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he, he sweat straight, great drops of blood and he said, my soul is overcome with sorrow, bereft. He became a laughing stock. They, they took him and they, they put a crown of thorns on his head and they draped a, 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 a purple robe, royal robe, around his shoulders and they mocked him and they laughed at him. He says in chapter 3, I, he led me in dark places. Do you remember on the cross when Jesus was hanging there right towards the end and suddenly God turned out the lights? The whole world was plunged into darkness. Jesus, who is the light of the world, was in darkness. Now, it's because he was taking on your sins and my sins. The awful weight, and it snuffed out the candle, and we're all in darkness. Just think back to the suffering that we find in... Um, Isaiah chapter 53, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, uh, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrow. You see, this is, this is Jesus. And when we see Jesus reminded of his humanity, you know, I don't think it was a mistake. I don't, I don't think it just happened by chance. I, I'm, I'm quite sure that Pilate didn't know what he was saying, but when he took Jesus out onto that balcony uh, just before the crucifixion, and here were all these people baying for the blood of Jesus, and he turned to him, he turned to the crowd and he said, behold, the man. Now, he didn't know, but he was, he was flipping back 500 years. Because in Lamentations, I am the man. And so here's the humanity of Jesus standing there, bedecked out in all the finery that should have been for a king. He's saying, he's the man. He's a man who knew darkness. He knew what it was like to be trapped. He knew what it was like to be weighed down. He knew what it was like to be afraid. He knew what it was like to be humiliated and in turmoil. He knew what it was like to be exhausted and it wouldn't go away. Now, I don't want to minimize your feelings. Many of you have been through dark times. Many of you have been through difficult situations. I have. And each of, those, each of those things were there in my life at that time. I was just a kid, not even a teenager. And my mother was dead. How was I going to cope? Where was God? And all of those feelings that are mentioned there, darkness, trapped, weighed down, afraid, humiliated, in turmoil, exhausted, and it wouldn't go away. Taken straight out of lamentations. But I want to tell you something. 
This passage that we've been reading, that John so eloquently read for us, it's not about me and it's not about you. It's not about you. It's about the I am, the man, Christ Jesus. And so Christ Jesus went through all of those things. And while we go through them, and we're not minimizing that, we go through all of those. And he's saying, me too. Me too. Man of sorrows. You see, it's not that Jesus stands off aloof with his arms folded while we go through our lament. You have a saviour who sees you in your pain, who's far off. And when you go through times filled with laments, you have a saviour who sees you in your pain, and he says, me too. I'll walk with you through it all. I'll bring you through. And Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Never. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of the wrath of God. The rod, of course, was... We know that the rod was one of the instruments that the shepherd took out into the field. The staff and the rod. The staff had a, was like a shepherd's crook with a big hook on the end. If a sheep got in the wrong place, they'd hook it, he'd hook it around the sheep and pull him back to safety. And the, the rod was like a, like a club, like a big baseball bat, really. And, and if, the, if a wolf or a, a lion came, he, he would belt the life out of them. Your rod, it comforts me, says the psalmist. The punishment that was due to us was put on him. He went through that for you and for me. We see... um, that verse 1 is quite clear. Jesus comes under the wrath of God. Not you. Not you. You don't come under the wrath of God. In fact, in fact, you will never, you will never, never come under the wrath of God. Jesus went there for you so that you don't have to go there. When I'm in darkness when I'm trapped, when I'm weighed down, when I'm afraid, when I'm humiliated, when I'm in turmoil, when I'm exhausted, and it won't go away, in Christ you can know that Jesus died for you. In Christ you can say, I'm not alone. I have Christ Jesus who stands, understands, because he's been there. But then he moves to a a wonderful passage, really. And he says, well, that's... It's the depth of where we go. And in verse 21 he says, Yet when I recall all of this to mind, and therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions, they never fail. They never fail. They are new how often? Every morning. Every morning. And I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. They're new every morning. So there are dark times and at the end of a dark night. The grace of God is there in the morning. In fact, why don't we read this together? Why don't we read it? Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope in him. Do you believe that? You see, God is, God is saying to us here, in this difficult passage, 
I make no pretense of that. It is a difficult passage. But he's saying, look, all of this stuff where, where it says that he did this and he did that, and so, it was to Jesus so that we don't have to do it. I am the man who has been under the wrath of God. I am the man. And because Jesus went through it, we don't have to. In, in converse, he's saying, it's all okay. okay. God will walk with you. He will not fail you. He'll be there every morning uh, afresh. Now, that's all very well. But caref- very carefully, I want to say to this to you. That's the Christian view. If you have Christ in your life as your saviour, you don't have to go through it. All of that dark stuff that John read to us, it's not meant for you. It was fulfilled in Jesus. But if you don't have Jesus in your life, If you've not committed yourself to him and asked for forgiveness, you're on your own. You're on your own. So the choice is there. It's a simple choice, really. Either we accept that Jesus did what he did and lifted that burden from us, or we say, bring it on, I deserve it. We need to look to Jesus, don't we? We need to look to Jesus. Now, if you need to use your hanky, that's fine. <laughs> I think I will once, once I've finished here. Because the enormity of what Jesus did sinks in again and again and again. I will never be under the rod of the, of the wrath of God. It's not the way he works in plan A. And I want to meet him on on the basis of plan A. Never on the basis of no decision. Now the music team's going to come and we're going to sing a song that points us to Jesus. And as we sing, if you If you sense that some of this stuff, that terrible stuff that John read to us, terrible, it's nothing to do with you, John. (laughs) You did check with me, didn't you? (laughs) But if you don't want to have that, the choice is simple. Let Jesus carry it. It's what he was created to do. So let's sing, let's respond place of prayer is always here. You can talk to somebody afterwards if you so wish. But God is saying, I've got a better plan. I've got a better plan for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.